let's break down state by state where we are. And um, big picture, basically every one of these averages, even the ones where Democrats still hold on to a uh, slim uh, or even significant lead, every one of them has been moving in favor of Republicans. And now you have, you know, 538, I didn't ch check it this morning, but for the first time they're giving Republicans a narrow edge in terms of winning the Senate. So you can just see the way the momentum is going right now. Even while saying, listen, polls could be wrong in a variety of directions, even though it's mostly been wrong in recent history in favor of the Democrats rather than in favor the Republicans, but who the hell knows what's going to happen. But I can just tell you the trend right now has been very much towards Republicans in every single one of these races. So let's look at Georgia first. We pulled the real clear politics average for all of these. You can see the trend line at the bottom, which has Warnock falling off somewhat, Walker rising significantly. Walker is now favored in, again, the real clear politics average by 1.6 percentage points. I went ahead and took a look at the last two polls in this race. Um, and it's a split decision in terms of the last two polls. Uh, the Fox 5 Insider Advantage poll had Walker plus three, the Republican. The New York Times Siena poll had Warnock plus three. Right. We went through last time how New York Times Siena has been in recent years more favorable towards Democrats. They've had a miss that, you know, so I would take anything that they have. And I think in Georgia, the miss was about three points. Yes, so you would have this as basically a total toss up. Actually, I believe the miss was four, which if anything, yeah, <laughs> for me, Walker right, plus for one, Walker. which mm -hmm. sounds right on the money with the which rest. Which is exactly what the real clear exactly. politics average the is. The average is 1.5. That's where if I, you know, again, if I had to put my money, that's probably where it would go. I think we're really just learning about structural advantages whenever you are the party in power in a national political environment. The day of local politics effectively died in 2010 with the Tea Party mm -hmm. wave and yeah, with the referendum right. on Barack Obama. And from that year forward, every single election, downstream, upstream, primary, everything has been on the major national questions. There are some marginal cases where we can argue that that's not the case, but by and large, that seems to be the overwhelming trend of politics. And candidate quality, increasingly, as we have seen, the data is bearing out that even if it's a really, really bad candidate, at best, you are talking about maybe a point or two, which is, you know, sad whenever you do think about it. But on the one hand, some localism does matter. Let's throw the next one up there, which is Arizona. This is where I think you could make a case where candidate quality has made it so that it is a much tighter race crystal than arguably and structurally that it should be. The RCP mm -hmm. average has Mark Kelly with a 2.3% advantage. Now, that's even with a Fox poll that shows Mark Kelly up by one. As we have seen, he actually is outrunning Joe Biden in his approval rating in the state. He's far above 50%. Yeah. He consistently hammers Biden on the border. He's you know talking about inflation. He has. It's a very strange situation because on the one hand, he does vote with the National Democratic Party, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's never been the kiss in cinema, stick in the mud on any of that. And yet locally has been able to make the case, he's like, no, I am an independent-minded figure. I don't necessarily go along with the Biden consent. He's even yeah. running ads, you know, even saying, talking about the president. I found it fascinating. Maggie Hassan is actually running her latest ad is, I'm standing up to President Biden, mm. which anytime you have to do that, by the way, is not good uh, yeah, for and you. It, and by the way, it rarely works. I was going to say, by the way, it never works. I'll never works. forget, you know, I've told a story, Chet Edwards, my congressman, mm -hmm. uh, who lost by the largest margin in 2010, and he uh, represented a Democrat for R plus 25 district. He ran, I remember one of his last ads, he was like, I'm standing up to Nancy Pelosi. And that's when I was like, yeah, he's going to lose. This <laughs> I was is, not like, going this not is gonna the happen. last gasp as <laughs> Effort here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, the other thing that was really persuasive to me in the New York Times polling about this race is even putting the, the candidates aside, which I think Mark Kelly is a strong candidate for Democrats. I think Blake Masters has been a very weak candidate for Republicans just because of some of the, you know, extreme views he's taken both on abortion but also on economic issues. But they also found in Arizona that social cultural issues were weighing more heavily on the electorate than in mm -hmm. other states. And they've had some sort of like fierce local state level battles around abortion rights and whether it's going to be completely banned in the state and those sorts of things. So it makes sense to me that in that way, there is a little bit of localism there where uh, abortion is weighing more heavily on voters' minds. So that would certainly give Mark Kelly a bit more of an edge. I think, you know, this is the race where consistently Democrats have held the largest um, the largest margin. 
it too is closing, you know, the, the gap is closing there as well. So I certainly don't think that it's out of the realm of possibility that Masters would win. But I think as you look at these races, the uh, Arizona one has to be the one where Democrats feel the most comfortable, have the best shot at, at being able to hold on ultimately. I think you're right. And let's throw, and why it's fascinating too is demographically, Arizona should be much more in play for the Republicans or for the Democrats uh, than, or, sorry, Nevada, which we're about to talk to. Let's put that up there on the screen, which is that Nevada demographically, historically, electorally, all of that should be far more favorable to the Democrats here, given that you have an incumbent Democratic senator, you have the state having gone for Biden and the la or for Democrats in the last two presidential elections. It has been tight, and yet we have had Adam Laxalt there up far more in, than over Catherine Cortez Masto than Mark Kelly has, or Blake Masters has over Mark Kelly. Mm -hmm. And I actually have been trying to figure out exactly why. You know, Cortez Masto is a very run-of-the-mill, just like median Democratic senator. Yeah. That possibly could be why. She just doesn't have as big of a statewide mm -hmm. type profile, which means that the national wins would move more in the Republican direction. But it is a really difficult one to square, right? Arizona, you know, Biden barely won the state in 2020. Uh, and before that, obviously, it was a solidly Republican state for decades. So to just look at Nevada trending so much right now in the GOP direction really does ask us a lot of questions about what that means. I, I'm fascinated by politics in Nevada because yeah. this is one of the few states where union support really, really makes to the right, especially places with large working class bases, Nevada has actually held pretty strong for Democrats. They've been able to hold on to that state, even as large swaths of the working class start to move towards the Republican Party. That's all because of the union base of support there, which, you know, we know that some union members, certainly a, a significant chunk at this point, vote for Republicans. But being in a union is still one of the most significant indicators of voting Democratic. So it still really matters a lot that you have a strong union base of support. So that's one point in favor of the Democrats. On the other hand, no state was hit harder during the pandemic than Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, you have, you do have, you know, a population that is heavily working class, working in the service sector, food prices, gas prices, all of these things weighing very, very heavily on this electorate. So whereas in Arizona, you have more voters saying they're focused on the social cultural issues. In Nevada, it's the mirror image situation where you have more, even more voters saying, no, no, this is all about the economy. And that's just very difficult waters for Democrats at this point. Now, Nevada is one of the states where the polls have been the closest to accurate. So you've got the Republican with about a two point lead right now. I mean, this thing has been tight the whole way through. It's yeah. basically been a jump ball in terms of the polling the whole way through. Whereas some of these other states you had, you know, at times Democrats with like a double digit lead. This one has always been extremely close. I pulled the last two polls here. Um, the Hill Emerson had the Republican Laxalt up five. USA Today Suffolk had Catherine Cortez Masto up by one. But again, the overall polling average has the Republican by almost two points. So, yeah, I definitely think you would rather be the Republicans just because, again, economic concerns, Democratic failures to message on economic concerns, probably going to override you know, the, the benefits that they have there in terms of unionization. If you didn't have that strong union presence there, this thing would be done and over and not even a question mark. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's, an, it's a crazy landscape. And it, with every single one of these states, like some flavor of localism is coming out, but the national trends are just really bearing so strongly behind. Yeah the Republicans, that in almost every case, except maybe Arizona, you just have to look at it and be like, well, that seems to be where things are blowing. By the way, we didn't include New Hampshire, but as I uh, as I alluded to earlier, actually this morning, a new Trafalgar poll actually came out uh, showing Bullduck up for the very first time by just one percentage point over uh, Maggie Hassan there in New Hampshire. That would be a major upset because it would yeah. be a gain for the, uh, for the Republicans well, over that seat. Go and ahead. it's not just uh, Trafalgar. Mm -hmm. uh, you also had a, a Sena Anselm poll was the, the other most recent poll that also had Balduck with a one-point lead. The overall average is now just 0.5 wow. in favor of yeah. Maggie Hassan. So yeah, this is this one has become a real toss-up. You know, uh, 
one thing on Georgia that I just want to make sure we note, which is that if neither of these candidates get to 50 percent, which is entirely possible, then that goes to a runoff. And, you know, that's a whole other situation. But in terms of who has the edge right now to uh, win the most votes on Election Day, looking like Walker. The last one is, you know, one we focused and the media has focused a lot of attention on, which is the Pennsylvania race between Fetterman and Oz. Let's go ahead and put those numbers up on the screen here. And you can see uh, Fetterman still clinging to a, a small lead here in terms of the average. Um, he's up by 1.2 in the Real Clear Politics average. And I pulled the last two polls. Monmouth has Fetterman plus four and Muhlenberg, Mullenberg College. <laughs> yes. Mullenberg. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> has it even? <laughs> has it as a, a jump ball? I mean, this one is, again, total jump ball. Um, and Pennsylvania is one of those states where pollsters have been missing, and they've been missing big. Yes. Because this is a state that has a significant white working class population, especially the western part of the state. They've been, you know, sort of consistently undercounting Republican support. And so the fact that Fetterman, in the average, only with 1.2 of a lead— that looks pretty dicey. And uh, two polls came out this morning, actually, with Oz at point one, at plus one entire mm. point. So the wow. Hill Emerson, yeah, putting him up at Oz, taking first time the lead in that poll in a Susquehanna, I believe I said that correctly. Sus Susquehanna, Susqu maybe? Whatever. All right. Sorry, Pennsylvanians. <laughs> uh, pin has him up by one as well. So very interesting. I mean, you're effectively, it's a total jump there, yeah. which, again, you know, given the way that the polling misses have been in the past, just the wins at the backs of the Republican Yes. Candidates. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.